All right, we welcome Coach Pearl to the stage. We'll remind you to please indicate when you have a question. We'll get a microphone to you. If you can direct your questions into the microphone, that would be tremendous. Questions for Coach Pearl. Hey, Coach. Uh, Eddie Pels from AP. Just kick it off with what, what you spent a couple years out of basketball. I think we all know about that. How tough was that for you? And, and did you have doubt that you would ever not only just get back to coaching, but get back to here? You know, I, I started coaching in, uh, in 1982. And what year is it now? 2019? And like I was, I was only out of coaching for three years. So I've basically been coaching my whole life. Um, and so you're going to ask me a question about the three years that I wasn't coaching. I'm 58 years old, two days ago, you know. So I want to talk about coaching. Uh, it's, uh, I love Auburn. I love the SEC. Um, I'm so proud of the SEC. 15 teams have made the NCAA tournament the last two years. Out of, uh, out of the SEC. That's a lot of progress you know, for our league. I did it six times at Tennessee, and now we've been able to do it a couple times here at Auburn. So obviously, it's what I've always done my whole life. Um, and so it was, uh, it's great to be, uh, have the opportunity to make a difference in young people's lives, because it's a ministry. Um, and uh, the ability to teach and to coach, and if you played, you remember the way you looked at your coach and the impact that your coaches had on your life, not just on the field and in the court, but off as well. So it, it's great to be able to, to be in this place. It's, it's where God wants me, and it's, it's where I feel very blessed to be. Bruce, uh, what's different about game planning for a team that can go 13 deep? 13 deep. Uh, you got to know all the personnel. I mean, look, Harris uh, and Brown are going to be key key matchups for us. Um, but when you get guys that didn't play against Kansas earlier in the season, I mean, like flat out didn't play, and then late in the year lead them in scoring, uh, you got to know you got to know them all. Um, just been very impressed with uh, with this New Mexico State team. Um, you know, they've only lost four games this year. Uh, Coach Jans is fifty like fifty seven and ten in his last two years. His losses this year, St. Mary's, they're in a tournament. Kansas, he, he, he about had them beat in Kansas City. Lost to Drake, who won the Missouri Valley Conference, and he only had one loss in his league. Chris Jans is one of the best young coaches in all of college basketball. Why? He's got a great pedigree. He grew up the hard way. He and I are kind of like second cousins in the sense that I spent some time as an assistant at Iowa, and he was at Kirkwood College right down the road. My former assistant, Steve Forbes, who is now the head coach at East Tennessee State, they were on the staff together. Listen to the staff. Greg Marshall, the head coach. Greg Heyer, the assistant coach, top assistant at LSU. Chris Jans, who's the head coach at Mexico State. And Steve Forbes, who's head coach at East Tennessee State. You talk about great coaches. Chris Jans also worked for Porter Mosier. They, they're good. They run great stuff. His kids play hard. And... Um, they, 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 they're, they're, uh, they'll be a tough out. Lindsay Schnell, USA Today. Bruce, I'm curious about the dynamic of having um, an assistant coach who used to be a head coach on your staff. What's good about that? Maybe what's annoying about that? Have you ever thought, I need to kick this guy to the curb and get a 25-year-old in here who's going to agree with everything I say? That's a great question. Um, this is not overused. Surround yourself with people better than you. You can do that now. There's a lot of head coaches out there, and I'm one of them that's lived that, I'm telling you. Um, and so, and Mike, in this year, you're talking about Wes Flanagan, who was a former head coach. Who was he an assistant for at one time? Chris Beard, pretty good head coach. Surround yourself with great people. But listen, I've got, I've got a guy named Chad Pruitt, who was a high school coach in Auburn. He's now my director of basketball operations. I'd stand him up against anybody. I've got, a, I've got an assistant director of basketball operations, Mike Burgermaster, that was a manager for Jim Laranega at Miami. Jim Laranega, pretty good coach. My son 
is my assistant coach. Nobody better to go to to find out what to and not to do to piss me off. I mean, you know, you know, it's just, it's so, so you, you just having a, a, a all different and, and listen to every voice, respect all the voices out there. And the one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to be so strong that they're intimidated to tell you what they think. I want to know what they think. I want them to challenge my thinking. Now, once we leave a meeting and a decision's made, now make my decision work. I'm gonna make that decision to the best of my ability. And it may not even be the right one, but let's go make it work. Billy, Billy Witz from the New York Times. Bruce, how, the, the three years that you spent not coaching, uh, this entire you know, long career, how are you a different coach now than you were before? That's a good question. I think, I think a little older, a little wiser, maybe a little bit more patient, um, maybe a little bit more grateful, humble. But I'll tell you something. When I was out of coaching for a few years, I had a lot of bills to pay still. And so my daughter Leah told me something that I'll never forget. I worked for a company for three years in addition to my time with XM Radio and ESPN called the HT Hackney Company. We were a wholesale distributor. We put stuff in convenience stores. That was my new family. And Leah told me that she had never been prouder of her father because I treated that job like it was my last, like it was my own. In other words, my job as a coach may be, may be a little bit more public and visible, but I had to take care of my family. I, I jumped into that job as, as a vice president. I worked seven days a week as hard as I possibly, I grinded, just like I had to do in coaching. So you do what you gotta do to take care of your family. And so if I gain my little girl's respect because I was no longer coaching, but I was putting candy in a, in a convenience store, I'd be okay. Bruce, how have you guys adjusted to the altitude and will it change the way you coach the game tomorrow? Well, we got out here yesterday, so we had a pretty good hard practice yesterday, got some run, got the dizzies, dizziness out of the kids, let them kind of feel. It's the first burn. It won't be the second or third, but the first time you get windy, you're like, Wow, this is different. After that, you're kind of adjusted to it. There are some things that you can snack on, some drinks you can have that can help alleviate that. There will be oxygen on the bench, most likely for me, not the players. Okay, I'll have oxygen there. My athletic director, Alan Green, wanted to make sure that I had, he wanted to make sure I had oxygen on the bench because he, he's seen me get elevated a time or two. Just curious, anything you got out of the out of the convenience store wholesaling job that you were able to bring into coaching or coaching into the other job? When when uh, I'll, t I'll I'll make this I'll make this transition for you. Um, when I was working for ESPN, um, I'd get done with a game or I'd get done with a studio show, and I two things. Number one, I I had no idea whether I had a good day or a bad day. You know what I'm saying? Okay. The second thing is, I didn't necessarily think I made anybody any better. And I was, for the first time in my life, getting paid for what I could do. What I realized is that I really can't do anything. My abilities is to help other people, empower other people, for them to do great things. So as a coach, it's my job to help my student athletes do great things, graduate, you know, serve in the community, play good basketball, or a staff. So what I did is I missed the coaching because I missed that. So what did I do? I took my thousand employees that I had working in the, that industry I was in, I just tried to make them better. I tried to help make them better what they did and as a result, we were better as a company, I hope. Bruce, uh, the narrative around this, well, one of the narratives around this team is you know, all you guys do is shoot threes, you guys shoot too many threes, but I mean, obviously it works. What do you, what do you when you hear that, what do you think? <laughs> it's, it's like when you listen to color guys and they say, press a pressing team. I hear that and they go, you don't know what you're talking about. Please press me, I love to be pressed. We press. You live by the three, you die by the three. That's a good one, right? That makes a lot of sense. 
How about this one that Hayden Fry said years ago as a football coach at Iowa? Scratch where it itches. Do what you do. If I've got five guys out there that can't shoot the three ball, do you think I'm going to have them shoot the three ball? Not for very long. We'll put four or five guys on the floor that can shoot it. What's most important is that I give them the confidence to shoot it. And then when they take a bad shot, I blame the other four guys for not getting the offensive rebound, bailing them out. Um, as long as that thing is going to be worth more than the two, and it's an open shot, most three balls, you don't get much contact. Every other shot on the court, with exception of a free throw, you're getting hit. If you can't make an open shot, it's hard to play the game. So, yeah, occasionally we shoot it early or take a bad shot or next play, just get to the next play. Uh, we spend a lot of time working on it. I, my, the, the, the best play in basketball, the best play in basketball is the, is the three-point shot, the inside three-point shot, and one. The second best play in basketball is outside that three-point line. Can you maybe just uh, describe the kind of what what came, seemed to come together after the Kentucky game? We went into the Kentucky game feeling pretty good about our team. We had won some games. We were we felt like we may have been one of the few teams that could actually go to Rupp and compete with them. That's how we felt going in. We got hit in the mouth hard. Kentucky played great, and you could see a difference lining up against them. And our guys saw a difference. And the, 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 so then what do you do about it? Because it is what it is. I think a couple things. One, we started to understand we had to make some offense out of our defense. If we sat there and let Kentucky line us up and do what they wanted to do, not very good. Second thing is, I think the guys understood at this point with four games left to go in a regular season, we got to win or we're not going to be in this tournament. We got to win or, or this season is going to be a disappointment. Everybody got locked in. Everybody got bought in. They started to trust each other, relying on each other more. And as a result, we pulled off eight straight. Bruce, one more career question. Do you have any memories of being involved in Utah State's coaching search 20 years ago? I do. I do. I was actually on vacation down in Dest. Grayton Beach, Florida. And uh, man, I was excited about that possibility. Uh, I think I was a Division II coach at the time at Southern Indiana. Um, I did not get very far in the process because they hired a guy named Stu Morrell. And it was one of the best hires in, uh, in college basketball because obviously Stu, Stu went there and did a phenomenal job. He's a way better coach than I've ever been or will be. And, uh, but I do, I remembered uh, I remember being excited about that possibility. Time for two more questions. Back to New Mexico State. How do you prepare for a team that, like somebody mentioned, that at any time one of 13 guys can go off on you and have a big night and, and impact the game? They don't have any weaknesses. Like they can score it inside and out. They can rebound the ball. They can defend. If you get past one guy, which is difficult because they move their feet really well, they strip and rip or take charges. Um, they're good. So, yeah, personnel is important, and they've got some tendencies, and we're, we're on those tendencies. But we have been the New Mexico State of the SEC. See, we play fairly similarly. And so we go in and we play with 10 guys, and we fly around. And we turn you over. And, and we shoot a lot of threes. Now, we're not as good a rebounding team as they are. Um, but maybe that has to do with the fact that we're in the SEC. But we, we, we haven't played against a team like New Mexico State unless we went against ourselves. So I would say, probably from that standpoint, it's a tough matchup for us because there's nobody in our league that plays like them. All right. Thank you, Coach.